Chris Sewell here, baseball card collector, investor, dealer in that order. Welcome, everyone. Today, I wanted to preview the upcoming Hall of Fame voting for baseball, which takes place in December. And that means the 2023 Hall of Fame class will get announced in January. And, uh, yeah, going to go through sort of the rules of the voting for those who aren't familiar with it and then run through with some of the players uh, who have sort of the best shot of getting in this year. It's an interesting year. There's no players really who is sort of, uh, you know, a lock or a very, very high likelihood of getting in. So that sort of bodes well for a lot of borderline players. It's, it's years like this where they have sort of a better shot of, of sort of sneaking in. So just a quick review of how the Hall of Fame voting works. Uh, after you've been retired for five years, you go into the Hall of Fame ballot. And then you can stay on the ballot up to 10 years as long as you receive 5% of the votes each year from the Hall of Fame uh, voting committee. If you receive less than 5% of the votes in any one year, you're dropped off the ballot and will no longer be on the ballot. And if in any one year you receive 75% or more of the votes, then you are officially elected into the Hall of Fame. This was the results of last year's voting. You can see David Ortiz was the only player who got elected. Uh, he got in with 77.9% of the votes on his first year of eligibility. And last year was also interesting because it had four players drop off the ballot, all of whom, if you just went by their career numbers, were, you know, lock Hall of Famers or maybe borderline Hall of Famers. But Barry Bonds, Roger Clemens, and Sammy Sosa were all linked to PEDs. And Kurt Schilling had some off-the-field stuff that hurt his cause as well. Uh, more on them coming up in a bit. So you can also get elected by one of the ERA committees. And uh, there are three ERA committees, and they rotate as to each uh, which one applies to each year. Last year, it was the Golden Days ERA committee, which... Uh, looks at players and, and non-players who, whose contribution to baseball occurred or whose, whose main contribution to, to baseball occurred prior to 1980. And they actually elected six players or uh, pioneers here last year. That's a lot to elect in a single season, but yeah, six got in last year. This year, uh, the era committee that will operate is the contemporary player uh, list, which means players who played the majority of their career after 1980. There are a bunch of names to consider for this, but uh, it's actually been whittled down to eight finalists and I'll uh, we'll go over those later in the video and before I jump into which players have a shot this season I want to just quickly review the stat war because I'm going to be mentioning it a lot and it, I think it's the best single stat in terms of calculating the likelihood of whether a player will make the Hall of Fame it's, it's not a standalone stat in that sense you have to factor in other things as well but uh, it does the best sort of loose estimate from any single stat and all war does is it tries to calculate how many wins a player is worth to their team if you have a war of five in a given season that means if you replace that player with an average level player at their position, uh, the team would lose uh, would win five fewer games. So they were they were worth five wins to their team, and you know in a sense that's sort of the best way to, to gauge a player's value. How how valuable were they to the team? How many wins are they worth? And it factors in everything: offense, defense. Uh, you know what position you play, uh, what sort of ballpark you play, in, all all these sort of uh, these sort of things. Here's a really, really loose estimate as to how likely you are to make the Hall of Fame based on your war. This is, I say really, really loose, but this is actually pretty, pretty accurate. If you, if you reach 80 career war and you're, you're going to make the Hall of Fame, there's actually no exceptions to that. Everyone who's reached 80 war has made the Hall of Fame, uh, ex not counting uh, not counting steroid guys. If you if you don't get to 40, you really have no shot. There are a couple exceptions there. There's a couple players who got in with like, they're in the high 30s, but that's really, really rare. If, you, if you're around 60, you're probably about 50-50, and uh, yeah, you can look at the chart there. And this, this chart does a pretty good job of estimating the likelihood you'll make the Hall of Fame based on your war. So here are the players that are returning to the ballot this year, meaning they were on the ballot last year, but they didn't get elected, but they also got enough votes to stay on the ballot, so they're back. Uh, and they're sorted here by the percentage of votes they got last year. Because You can see Scott Rowland got the most percentage of votes last year, 63%, getting pretty close there. Uh, Todd Helton and, and Billy Wagner right around 50 and then all the way down to the lowest of Tory Hunter who got 5.3% uh, of the votes just barely stayed on on the ballot and if you look at everybody's war the number that jumps out most is Alex Rodriguez with 117 that's you know a, a lock first ballot Hall of Famer normally but he was linked to PEDs and given that Barry Bonds and Clemens and, um, and, and McGuire and Sosa have all dropped off and didn't get voted in in the, tr the traditional Writers Association way, I would be really surprised if uh, A-Rod you know, ended up getting it voted in this year or in, in any of the upcoming years. There are other players on this list linked to PEDs as well. Uh, Gary Sheffield, Manny Ramirez, and Andy Pettit. So I'd say none of those probably have a realistic chance of getting in this year. You can see nobody else got to the, uh, the, the 80 war mark, which is sort of like the Lock Hall of Famer. Scott Rowland got the closest at 70, and he, he's also got the, most, uh, the highest percentage of votes last year. So he would see to sort of be your, your top candidate. And then there are a bunch of other players who got to around 60, which again puts them in the sort of, you know, approaching the 50-50 mark to eventually get in. 
Two other quick player notes I'll mention. Jeff Kent is the only player in his last year of eligibility. He's in his 10th year on the ballot. That often often players in their last year sort of get a bump from the voters as it's their, their last chance to vote for a player. Uh, he only got 33% last year, so that would he would need quite a bump. But yeah, he, he does have that sort of advantage, I guess we'll say. And Omar Vizquel, he was projecting to easily make the Hall of Fame about three or two or three years ago. But then he had uh, he had some domestic abuse allegations. I, I don't know whatever happened with them, but that basically killed his chances. And here are the players appearing on the ballot for the first time. It's not a particularly strong class. Uh, if you look at their career war, there's only one player who even reached 40, and that's Carlos Beltran, uh, who yeah, who reached 70, which which puts him in the sort of likely category. Although more on that coming up. There's nobody else here who I think has any sort of realistic chance of making the Hall of Fame, with the one exception of. Uh, Francisco Rodriguez down there at the bottom. He's also a closer, and his career career numbers look pretty strong. Uh, he, he ranks really high in, in categories like saves. So uh, the only two players I would think have any sort of chance from this list are Carlos Beltran and Francisco Rodriguez. And I would expect most players here to be off the ballot uh, after after their first year. All right, let's go through player by player, at least the players that I think have the best chance of getting in, and then we'll do the uh, era committee players after that. Uh, we'll start with Scott Rowland, who I think has the best chance of getting in the Hall of Fame this year. This is his 1995 Bowman rookie. He doesn't have many rookies. He's got the Bowman. This comes in like a gold foil parallel. He also has the Bowman's best, and uh, that comes with a refractor. But uh, like I said, 70 career war, that, you know, that's probably enough to get him in. The career numbers really aren't, aren't really there. 2,000 career hits, uh, 300, you know, just over 300 home runs. That, that's not really enough. 281 batting average is nothing exciting. Seven all-stars and eight gold gloves. Those that, That's sort of really impressive. So I, I would say the 70 career war and the eight gold gloves probably get him in, and I think he does benefit this year from the uh, voting situation. All right, next up is Todd Helton. That's his 1993 Topps traded rookie. I believe that's his only official rookie card. Career war of 62 is interesting comparing him to Scott Rowland. The uh, war is down, 62 down from 70, but all the career numbers are way up. 2,500 hits, uh, 369 home runs, 316 batting average. Uh, that's an impressive stat, clearly the most impressive stat that he has. Uh, over 1,400 runs and RBIs for his career. Those are both pretty solid numbers. Three gold gloves and five all-star games. I mean, he does get a knock against him because he played in Colorado, which was a very hitter-friendly park, so a lot of people would probably argue that his offensive numbers were a bit inflated. Looking at his voting results over the last few years, I would put him at like not 50-50, but let's say a, a one in three, one in four chance of, of getting elected this year, something like that. Next up is Billy Wagner, and this is 1994 Topps rookie. He's actually got a bunch of rookies from 1994. I think the SP is maybe his most desired. Uh, they're, they're pretty inexpensive. This Topps card here is Topps rookie. You can get probably for like a buck, something like that. Uh, but like I said, 28 career war, although war really doesn't apply to closers. 422 career saves. That ranks 6th all-time, although uh, we'll probably probably rank 8th all-time by the end of next season. 231 career ERA. That's incredibly impressive, a career whip below 1. Uh, these are all impressive numbers, although uh, closers generally have a pretty tough time making, making it into the Hall of Fame. I'd say he's got a shot this year, but I'd put him in the uh, pretty unlikely category. I'll mention Alex Rodriguez real quick here. This is his 1994 Upper Deck rookie. He has a bunch of rookies. They're all Upper Deck brands. Upper Deck, Upper Deck SP, Upper Deck Collector's Choice. And he, like I've mentioned before, would be basically a lock hall of famer. 117 war. I mean, that is pretty amazing. And that would actually put him as one of the top, you know, 20 players of all time. Three-time MVP, 14-time All-Star. These are all you know, no-brainer first ballot Hall of Fame numbers. But he was linked to PEDs, and like I mentioned, with the other players who were, you know, all-time greats but linked to PEDs, uh, not making it in and, and eventually getting bumped off the ballot, and they're going to have to get in through one of the, you know, the era committees later on. I, I don't see how Alex Rodriguez, how you could justify voting in Alex Rodriguez when you didn't put in Bonds or, uh, or Clemens in the, in the traditional manner. And the only other returning player with, I think, any sort of long shot of getting in is Jeff Kent. I do think it's a long shot, but like I said, it's his last year on the ballot, and sometimes that'll give players a, a bit of a boost. This is 1992 Donruss, the rookies, a uh, rookie card. He's also got rookies in the score traded, uh, Fleer Update, Leaf, and Pinnacle set. I think that's it, but again, very inexpensive cards. You could probably pick this card up for a buck or two as well. A uh, 55 career war is really just uh, really probably too low to get him in. His career numbers are okay. 25 career, uh, 2,500 hits, 377 home runs, a decent batting average, 1,500 RBIs, uh, won an MVP award, five All-Star games. You know, it's sort of borderline. To me, the thing that's the most impressive about him is he has the most home runs for any second baseman in Major League Baseball. It doesn't seem like the second baseman with the most career home runs should be in the Hall of Fame. I guess that would be my uh, 
tough argument if I was making the case for, for Jeff Kent. Again, I put him at sort of like an extreme long shot here, but uh, you know, not zero. All right, next let's check the players who have a shot being on their first year of eligibility. First up is Carlos Beltran, who's an interesting one. That's his 1995 Tops traded rookie. It's actually an error card. That's uh, not Carlos Beltran in the photo there. That's a player named Juan LeBron. But uh, yeah, this is the uh, you know official Carlos Beltran rookie card, 1995 Tops traded. Beltran would be basically a, a surefire Hall of Famer. Career war of 70, maybe not in his first year of eligibility but eventually career war of 70 and and the career numbers just are, they're just high enough where you would have to put them in eventually 2700 career hits 400 plus home runs uh, 1500 plus runs in rbis over 300 stolen bases one of the very very few players in the 300 home run 300 stolen base club nine time all-star these numbers are just too high he, he would eventually get in maybe not in his first year but eventually uh, but he was linked to the astro the houston astros cheating scandal in 2017 and uh, he was one of the main players in that scandal. So I don't know how the voters are going to deal with that. Sort of an unprecedented situation. I would imagine they're not going to put him in, certainly not in the first year. They may overlook it eventually, but I would be kind of surprised if he get, got in in his first year, although I guess I guess he has a shot. And the other first-timer with a shot is Francisco Rodriguez. That's his 2000 Bowman rookie. And uh, again, he's a closer, so war doesn't really matter. 437 career saves. That ranks fourth all time, and that would clearly be the argument for putting him in. Uh, you know, fourth all time in career saves. But uh, you know, compared to Billy Wagner, they're very similar. He's got just a few more saves than Wagner, and has a higher ERA. So, given the fact that Wagner's in his fifth or sixth year on the ballot and still hasn't gotten in, it would be hard to imagine Francisco Rodriguez getting in in his first year. Although I do think he has a shot. I would sort of put him in the uh, unlikely, unlikely category, but uh, with a shot. All right, now let's talk about the uh, era committees. And again, the era committee this year will be looking at players whose who's, the majority of their career happened after 1980. And there's a long list of players to consider here. And they just whittled it down to uh, eight finalists. And I was very, very surprised about the eight who were chosen as finalists. Here are just some of the names that have been considered in the recent past. Dwight Evans, Dave Parker, Lou Whitaker, Don Mattingly, Dale Murphy, Albert Bell, Will Clark, Earl Hershiser, Joe Carter, Mark McGuire, Ron Guidry, Dan Kiesenberry. Here are players who are appearing, who are now candidates for the first time this year. And you can see a bunch of the players who just got bumped off who are linked to PEDs, you know, Barry Bonds, Roger Clemens, Sammy Sosa. Also Kurt Schilling just uh, got bumped off the ballot. Also Fred McGriff and Kenny Lofton are appearing as uh, legit candidates for the first time. And there are a bunch of other names that they considered, as you can see here. And, you know, this list includes Mark Grace, Ken Griffey Sr., Dwight Gooden, Jose Canseco, and, and a bunch of others. So after looking over all those names, here are the eight finalists this year for the uh, for the ERA committee. Basically, the only eight players are going to consider to be elected this year. Uh, first thing to note is you got uh, Bonds and Clemens on there, two PED guys who just dropped off the ballot. The Bonds and Clemens are all-time greats, but... Again, they did not receive the, the enough votes in the standard traditional way because of PEDs. Rafael Palmero is also a, a PED guy, also whose numbers alone would easily put him in the Hall of Fame. But you know, he, he didn't get any anywhere near the consideration needed during uh, during his ten years on the ballot. I don't even know if he had he might have dropped off the ballot at some point. Kurt Schilling is also there. Uh, remember, he just dropped off last year. And then you also have Albert Bell, Don Mattingly, Fred McGriff, and uh, Dale Murphy. They can elect none of these players or all eight of them this year. Uh, or anything in between. So let's go through each of these one by one. So first up is Barry Bonds. That's his 1986 Topps traded rookie. He's also in the 86 Donners the Rookies set and the 86 Fleer update set. And actually his 87 cards are considered rookies as well because all his 86 cards are in update sets. So he has an 87 Donruss, Fleer, and Topps rookie as, uh, as well. If you ignore the PEDs, Bonds would be, in my opinion, one of the two greatest baseball players of all time. 163 war ranks second all time amongst position players. All-time home run leader, uh, both single season and career. Seven-time MVP, that is ridiculous. More than twice anybody else. 14-time All-Star, all these numbers are just uh, incredible. It's an unprecedented situation. Obviously, PEDs have kept them out up till now, and the era committees have never dealt with a candidate like this. Uh, you know, an all-time great player who had PED issues. You know, the closest probably would be Pete Rose some 20, 30, 40 years ago, I guess, at this point. But, you know, that was not done through the era committees, and uh, that was gambling on baseball as opposed to PED. So a different scenario. Really not sure how uh, how the era committee will handle Bonds and Clemens, but I, I would guess they're not going to put them in in their first uh, first year here. Next up is Roger Clemens. That's his 1984 Fleer update. Next, actually, is only 84 uh, rookie card. Since it's in the update set, his 1985s are considered rookies as well. He's got a 1985 Donruss Fleer 
and a tops. Uh, very similar to Bonds, as we mentioned, 140 war that is off the charts. Uh, and he would probably be considered one of the maybe three best starting pitchers of all time, if not for PED. Seven times Cy Young, like Bonds, that is absolutely ridiculous. And uh, everything I said about Bonds regarding PEDs applies here as well. Sort of an unprecedented situation, my guess was would be they don't put him in, in his uh, first year on the era committee. But uh, again, it's not uh, not something that's ever been dealt with before. Next up is Rafael Palmero. That's his 1987 Topps rookie. He also has a rookie in the 1987 Don Reset. Just going by the numbers, he's an absolute lock Hall of Famer. 72 career war puts him in the you know highly likely category, but way over 500 home runs and over 3,000 hits. Either of those numbers alone gets him in the Hall of Fame. Normally, there's no player with either of those uh, milestones who is not on the Hall of Fame, not linked to PEDs, and he reached both of them, one of the very, very few players to reach both of those uh, those stats. Now, he's got going to have a tough road here. He's you know clearly third in terms of the PED guys on this list. As great as he was, he's, he's clearly behind Bonds and Clemens in the all-time great category. So in order to get elected this year by the ERA committee, Bonds and Clemens would have to also both get in. And then Palmero, you know, I don't really see that happening. But again, this is sort of uncharted territory. Next up is Kurt Schilling. That's his 1989 Donner's rookie. And that's actually his only rookie card. You can see him portrayed there with the Baltimore Orioles. Didn't play much with the Orioles. Played most of his career with the Phillies and uh, and the Diamondbacks. Just going by the numbers, he's he's probably Hall of Famer. I mean, he really is a Hall of Famer, to be honest. 79.5 war, that that alone is sort of enough. The career totals are not amazing, but they're, they're certainly good enough. Over 3,000 strikeouts. And he also has some impressive uh, World Series performances, which should should add to his case. Now, he had some uh, major off-the-field stuff uh, that has really hurt his cause in the, in the voting. Some very controversial, you know, statements and viewpoints. I don't know how that's going to, you know, apply here to the ERA committee. If I were to guess, I would, I would guess he does not get in this year. All right, now the four players who don't have all this controversy and off-the-field PED stuff surrounding them. Uh, first up is Don Mattingly, 1984 Donner's rookie there on screen. He's also in the tops. He also is a Topps rookie and a Fleer rookie from 1984. And Donnie Baseball, this card here is was one of the hottest cards in the hobby for uh, a number of years in the late 19, 1980s. And, you know, some people I mentioned to today, like Don Mattingly's not in the Hall of Fame, and, you know, the, their first reaction like, what, what, how is that possible? Because they, they remember Mattingly being such a huge figure in the sport in the in the late 80s. If you go by the numbers, they're really just not there. He, his career war of just 42 he just didn't play long enough to accumulate accumulate Hall of Fame worthy numbers. 2,000 hits, 200 home runs. Th- these just aren't enough. A batting average of 307. That's pretty impressive. And nine Gold Gloves is is, is pretty uh, impressive as well. But again, if you look at all these numbers in isolation, this probably isn't a Hall of Fame career. Now, the argument you can make for Don Mattingly is that he reached the elite level of the game, which very very few people do. For for a good three or four year stretch, he was essentially the best player in baseball, or one of the two best players in baseball. We'll say. Uh, and you know, so that would be the case to make for Mattingly if you valued, you know, reaching eliteness if even just for a short period over longevity, where you accumulate numbers. All right, now Dale Murphy, who I think is a very similar case to Don Mattingly. This is 1977 Topps rookie. He shares it with uh, three other players. Obviously, that is his only rookie. He's shown as a catcher here, but he actually played most of his career as an outfielder. Like Mattingly, the num- the career numbers really just aren't there. 46 WAR. That's sort of at the low end of, you know, consideration. Only 2,000 career hits. He did at 398 home runs, which is decent, but you know certainly not enough to get you in alone. 265 batting average is pretty low, and there's if you just look at all these numbers in isolation, I, I don't I don't think there's a Hall of Fame career there. But like Mattingly, he did reach the, the elite level of the game for a good you know three four year stretch or so in the early 1980s. Dale Murphy was one of the best players in the game, and and, and literally one of the two or three best players in all of baseball, and he even won back to back MVPs in that period. So. That would sort of be the case if you were arguing on, uh, you know, Dale Murphy's behalf. Next up is Albert Bell, who again is sort of a similar case to Mattingly and Murphy. Not quite, but same sort of idea. Played his first two seasons as Joey Bell, which is why you see that on the card there. But that's his 1989 score traded rookie. He's also in the 1989 Fleer update set. And those, those are his only two rookies, and they are extremely cheap. You can pick them up for less than a dollar. Again, the career numbers really just aren't there. 40 career war is basically the bare minimum. 1,700 hits, not very impressive. 381 home runs, that's okay. 295 batting average is nice. Uh, but, you know, if you just look at all these numbers in isolation, this, this probably is just not a Hall of Fame career. Uh, but again, the argument to be made for him is that he was great while he played. He actually only played 12 seasons and really only played 10 full seasons. So to accumulate these numbers in 10 full seasons where, you know, many of the other players in the Hall 
are playing 15, 16, 20 seasons, you know, that's the case to be made. And, and you could say that Albert Bell was one of the three, four, five best hitters of the 1990s. And that would sort of be, you know, the case to be made for him. He was, he didn't play very long, but he was great while he played. And the last candidate to look at is Fred McGriff. That's his 1986 Donner rookie. He's one of the very few players whose rookie card appears in the 1980s, but he only has one rookie card. He wasn't in the Fleer or the top set for whatever reason. I guess he does have the 86 Leaf as well, but that's essentially just a uh, parallel. McGriff is a really interesting one to me. He, he got very, very little consideration when he was on uh, the ballot for 10 years, just never got anywhere near close. And I'm not saying he's like a lock Hall of Fame or anything, but to me, he should have gotten more consideration. 53 career war is a little low, but the number that really stands out is 493 career home runs. There's no player with that many home runs who's not in the Hall of Fame, who's not a PED guy. You know, 500 home runs is essentially like a, a milestone lock, lock number for the Hall of Fame. He got 493, so I don't know why he didn't get more, more of a look. Uh, the rest of the numbers are sort of okay to good, not great if you're making a Hall of Fame case. Uh, but again, the home run total, I think, should have led to more of a consideration. All right, I'm going to sort of make a prediction here, but let me be clear up front. I have no insider information, and this is just, you know, one random guy's best guess. I also make this prediction every year because it's something I, I try to, one of the few sort of fun prediction, you know, gambling aspects of investing in sports cards that I do, but I, I get it wrong essentially every year. So these should be used for entertainment purposes only. I'm going to predict that Scott Rowland gets voted in this year by the baseball writers, and he's the only person they elect. Uh, Todd Helton, Billy Wagner will both sort of get, you know, more votes than they've had in the before, sort of increase their odds that they'll eventually get in, but not enough this year. Carlos Beltran and Francisco Rodriguez won't get in this year, but will get enough votes to make it sort of likely that they will eventually. And on the era committee, I'm going to say that uh, they're going to elect two players, and they're both going to be from group one, as you see it here. They're not going to elect any of the PED guys, nor Kurt Schilling. They're going to uh, select two players from group one. If you made me guess, I'm going to guess uh, Don Mattingly and Fred McGriff. So that's it for my preview of the upcoming Hall of Fame voting. Uh, let me know what you all thought in the comments of this video, which whether you enjoyed this or not. I really like making this sort of content, but you know, it's not really sports card real, uh, focused. So I don't know if people uh, appreciate that or not. But uh, yeah, would love to hear people's opinions. Also, you know, do you think my analysis on each player was accurate, or do you think I missed some things? I'm sure that I did, and I'm sure other people have, you know, strong opinions about some of these, some of their favorite players growing up. So would love to hear that in the comments as well. But until next time, have a great day. Stay safe, eat your vegetables, all that good stuff. Thanks, everyone.